we are running a school book Ponzi scheme. It's a school book Ponzi scheme. I'm not meaning it as an analogy. I'm meaning it as an actual. A Ponzi scheme is if you use the future to pay for the presence. In a Ponzi scheme, you pay the present investors by scamming the future investors. And then, like, so, then you expand, as long as you can expand <laughs> the investment base. So that's what, we are, that's what we're doing ecologically. Matnitz Wackernagel is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas, brought to you by 1.5 Media and Innovators Magazine. Matis uh, started his PhD, co-created the ecological footprint in the early 1990s with his PhD advisor, Professor Rees, at the University of British Columbia. Now he is president of Global Footprint Network, which he founded in 2003 with Susan Burns. Together with its partners, Global Footprint Network focuses on bringing about a sustainable economy in which all can thrive within the means of our one planet. Since 2003, this international think tank has engaged with more than 50 nations, 30 cities, and 70 global partners to deliver scientific insights for policy and investment decisions. With their annual Earth Overshoot Day, they annually reach over 4 billion media impressions. His awards include many, many, the 2018 World Sustainability Award, the 2015 IAIA Global Environment Award, the 2012 Blue Planet Prize, the 2012 Binding Prize for Nature Conservation, the 2012 Kenneth E. Boulding Memorial Award, 2011 Zaid International Prize for the Environment and Honorary Doctorate from the University of Bern and the 2007 Skull Award for Social Entrepreneurship. Matis, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Mark. It's a pleasure. <laughs> You've been doing this a long time. You you yeah. uh, came up with a, a, a kind of your PhD thesis, I guess, so to say, as well, and been uh, been reading, studying, working on it for quite some time. And um, you you've also uh, been involved in two books. So the the first book, our ecological footprint, reducing human impact on the earth, with William E. Reese, your uh, same person who helped you with the your PhD thesis, and then this wonderful book that I have in front of me right here, <laughs> ecological footprint. Um, came out in 2019. You worked with it with uh, Bert Byers. I, I hope I'm saying that right. He's mm -hmm. here in Hamburg with me. He lives not too far away he's from awesome. me here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and he's an awesome <laughs> guy. And, and the ecological <laughs> footprint managing our bio capacity budget. And um, you are both awesome. So not only is Bert awesome and, and William Reese and you, you're, you're all awesome. And, and I'm so glad to be here. I mean, um, my listeners have said, I mean, we never see Mark so excited because we can talk for hours and we will have tons to talk about, but we've got to kind of structure it because we'll be here a couple of days because we really have a lot to, <laughs> uh, of ground to cover, but we want to take everyone kind of on a journey. And first and foremost, that journey begins with, we've been through some absolutely crazy times this last 12 plus months. Um, of Black Lives Matters, of uh, raci racism against Asians, about craziness with an inauguration and a, a rampant um, politician in the U.S. and and um, also the pandemic, the lockdown. Oh yeah, and, that know, one. <laughs> uh, yeah, on, on and on and on, and it just it just doesn't stop. Yeah. And and uh, but but you have been thinking about ecology. You've been thinking about biodiversity. You've been thinking about you know, climate change and models and tools and things and ways to look at the world to not only measure and uh, get a clear understanding of your footprint, but maybe some tools and things to do to, to have a better operating model, to live a better life or live a different life or live within the planetary boundaries and, and do some different things when you have this awareness. Uh, for me, it, it, it was a time... Um, 
to kind of see that that it's a better business model. It's a better operating system, so to say. It gives you more resilience. It's it, you can weather through that uh, rough times in some circumstances. And so my real question is, um, how have you weathered this crazy time? And have you seen? Uh, I, I read read the numbers on your website, and and there's. A, unbelievable numbers and earth overshoot day has great response. Did that go up? Um, did you see anything that we need to be aware of? And how have you weathered this crazy time up until now? Yeah, 2020, <clears throat> and we're still in it to some extent, has been an amazing or year I mean, in, in so many ways. And, and yes, I speak with incredible privilege because I mean, once is like I have a grown child. So it's, I wasn't stuck at home with a child. I'm, I have a comfortable home. I live in a climate that is very comfortable. I could go on my bicycle rides. I could work from home. The internet was there because I could continue my work. Of course, I mean, there were limitations, but overall I had it extremely, extremely easy. And um, and also many amazing things came out of 2020. So if you think about Black Lives Matter, that's it's not just relevant for Oakland where I live, but the, the United States and, and the world. I mean, kind of the, the reflection about our colonial culture. And when I mean colonial culture, it's really this shift from <clears throat> does the earth or does land belong to us <laughs> or do we belong to the land? That's really distinguishing feature i would say and so colonialism is not just a privilege of the europeans it's, it happens it happens around the world it's it's a, it's a mindset i think it's deeply ingrained in, in urbanism we build cities nearly willy and we think we can just get things from somewhere else so this idea that we can always get more from somewhere else and we have to write to it is this mathematically questionable apart from <laughs> ethically it puts the colonialists at risk as well, because we are over exploiting our hosts. I remember I went to New York some years back in, in, in the natural, it was natural art history museum of New York, where they showed how they were thinking about when it was still called, so they were mostly in Manhattan, it was called the New Amsterdam in the South. They thought, wow, Manhattan, how many people could live in Manhattan? And they came up with about a million people. Uh, and they didn't plan yet central parks. They just kind of graded it all out and say how many people could live there. And they realized, wow, how do we feed them? And that was the impetus to build the Erie Canal because they realized you build a big city, you need to be able to feed them. And the Erie Canal, I, I don't know by, by how many percent, perhaps by 95% reduced the effort to bring grains from the Great Plains uh, to New York. So there was a much more... I mean, it's still a colonial, but it's an ecological thing of saying, wow, we are actually, the people there that need to eat. How do we feed them? Now we build cities nilly-willy with very little concern. How do we maintain them? And so I think the, 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 the importance of resource security just hasn't fully lived up. Now, last year, that has been a little bit of a, <laughs> a shakeup um, in, in many ways, and we will not know fully what the implications are. But I mean, one realization is, I think it may have, shaken us a little bit out of our electromechanical mindset that we think, oh, it's just kind of about machines or climate change about machines or just the carbon. How do we manage the carbon? That actually we are biology. And that's wonderful. And that's unique. And, and there are not many planets that support biology and that support life. There may be others. We don't know of them. This one is an amazing one. And, and, and so we are like, this is, <laughs> we have evolved with that biology. We are connected as we now know through, through, um, through COVID. I just did a, a rough calculation. You know, talk about the butterfly, butterfly effect. <laughs> Actually, it's much more extreme. The weight of all the coronaviruses around in the world is probably far less than the weight of a butterfly wing. Or part of a way. I mean, it's like just, and that's so that that information that spread and then and how it disrupts our uh, our system. So we are one biology, but by by recognizing we are biology, actually the word becomes simpler because you start to realize it's not a coincidence that we have a water crisis and a biodiversity crisis and a climate crisis and a soil crisis all at the same time. They are symptoms of an overarching theme that the big bottleneck, material bottleneck we face is the size of regeneration on this planet. And how much can the biosphere regenerate in terms of biomass? That's kind of the life force in a, in a quantitative sense. And, and how much 
do we take? That's the bottleneck. And so by looking at biology in a whole, recognizing as regeneration, that's really the 80, 90% thing of everything. If you think environment, that's kind of the, the big lens. It actually becomes easier to understand the world. So understanding regeneration, we call it biocapacity to be more specific, is a bit of concept like gravity you know so so it's not like are you against gravity or for gravity actually by understanding gravity we can build build better bridges we can build better houses architects who don't understand gravity they um, this won't be as successful and it's still hard to go up the hill if you know about gravity it doesn't make it easier to go up the hill but you understand why it's hard to go up the hill in the same way it's just helpful to understand regeneration to understand biocapacity if you want to construct economies that will not fall apart. So it's a, it's it's pretty straightforward. I love that. that I, I love the way that you kind of tie that all together. And, and obviously, you've weathered it well. The numbers before um, the pandemic hit were really strong uh, on the website and people kind of looking at Earth Overshoot Day. With this pause or with this time of, of lockdown, a couple of things occurred, uh, and I and I want you to kind of get into deeper uh, in a minute uh, of exp explaining for those who who don't know and haven't followed the concept of Earth Overshoot Day or Global Hectare. Um, but last year, 2020, uh, August 22nd, 2020 was Earth Overshoot Day. Um, it was about 24 days that we kind of went in the other direction again, instead of even worse. Um, uh, and we could talk about that. I, that. There's there's a lot of you know it's not necessarily a positive thing. Although you know we we uh, we did gain 24 more days. With that, did you also see people going to the website even more now, say more ecological awareness, more biodiversity awareness, more interest in climate and in what's going on in our world, and making that connection? Say. We didn't really pay attention, but now we're starting to connect the dots where we've got more time to think and reflect. There's, you know, we're locked down. We're experiencing these things. They're looking for answers that you've actually experienced more outreach from organizations and people going to the website. So that did that number go up or down? Are there anything during this time that you've seen that you can kind of tell us what you've experienced where maybe more cracks or bubbles in the system have come to the surface that you've noticed just kind of from your lens and your view, what, what have you seen and what's the reality of what's transpired yeah, during this yeah. time? I mean, all, we, we all look at the world from our particular lenses and I think how much the world is fragmented and polarized. We, st we start to realize and people live in the social <laughs> media bubbles, et cetera. There are lots of kind of, there's some more international polls. I think UNEP has done one in terms of how people recognize climate and, 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 and environmental issues that's really significant. Even the World Economic Forum, they, they, they do their so-called global risks report. All the top risks are environmentally driven. Uh, it's, 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 so, so I think there's that recognition uh, of that. I also know people are tired. So it's like they, they don't like to hear about more problems. Uh, so that's what we what we see as well. And, and we're not talking about problems per se. We just we recognize the dynamic. The dynamic is called like the, it's overshoot. I mean, the, 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 the strange thing about overshoot is the following. To me, it's the big driver of the 21st century that defines all other problems overall. I mean, affects them in terms of uh, conflict, violent conflicts. Uh, I mean, pandemics also. I mean, if, if, if you take too much in an ecosystem, you're, you become the monocrop, you know, that, that is very uh, susceptible uh, uh, to diseases. So that, that, that misbalance Ecolo economically we become more fragile because we, we depend on resource flows that we cannot maintain. So, I mean, you think of any type, type of, 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 of calamity, it's based on kind of this overconsumption that our that our size, our human size, the human presence has become too large compared to what the ecosystems can um, renew. And yet, most languages don't have a good name for overshoot. If you ask people in the English language what's overshoot, most people don't fully understand. It's like if you have like a major disease, that's like the, the major disease that kills most people, and the doctors don't even have a name for the, uh, for, for the disease, let alone a therapy, let alone thinking it's a disease. 
<laughs> I mean, it's, it's so, so that's kind of the weird thing. And I think with, with some pride, we have been able to bring the story out because there have been others talking about it as well. But I think with, 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 with uh, Earth Overshoot Day, which was not my invention, so it's kind of a, a, a friend told, uh, gave us the idea of saying, hey, that may be a great idea to do that. It's a way to have been able to bring that thinking into the public domain in a way that uses very simple words. So, so we need no concepts. So what's Earth Overshoot Day? I can say it in words that every primary school student understands. You say from January 1st till August 22nd last year. People used as much from nature as the entire planet can renew in the entire year. Now, how complicated is that? You know, they know, like there's no, I think from January is the only three syllable word and January is understood by primary school <laughs> kids. So, and they understand, wow, August 22nd, that's still a long term time before Christmas and Christmas not even at the end of the year, you know? So, wow, that's, that's something not right. So, so not only do you give the ideas without using complicated words, you even give a quantity. Uh, that people can, oh yeah, actually it's August 22nd, that's too early, you know? So, so that's kind of helpful. Now, what do we do with that? How do we bring, make that empowering? And, and uh, we have now for a number, one of our communications people came up with the idea of saying, let's call it move the date. Because the big problem with sustainability is that people know too much and much of it is misconception. And I think, I don't know if it's Mark Twain who said that or somebody like Mark Twain who said, the problem is not things we don't know, but the things we think we know, but ain't so, you know? So, and, and I think that's a lot with sustainability. So sustainability is seen as kind of this moral burden of saying, yeah, we should, but then we'll have to suffer and I can't eat chocolate anymore. And, and I am part of that crime too. And I've been in the early days, we had these buttons. I was very proud of it. We got that from a big company in Canada. It said, reduce your footprint. And I went around the world and gave lectures and I gave these buttons to people. Even that hat said, reduce your footprint and shopping bags and all these, these things. Reduce your footprint. And in, 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 in Chile, after, after a presentation, this is brilliant woman in the back, young student, put up her hand and said, why should I reduce my footprint so that you can eat more chocolate? I thought that was just stunning. And that has really totally shifted my relationship to communication and narrative of saying, absolutely. That was, that was so, that's so brilliant. Why, like, why would I want to reduce my footprint? Because I think the big battle we are in today is not so much about whether people recognizing that we are, destroying the planet. I mean, we, are, we, we are, I think, not have a full picture and understand well and the dynamics, so we can go into that as well. I mean, we recognize something is not right. But I think the biggest challenge, the biggest limitation is to these two tracks, that the main view is, and, 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 and kind of the sustainability professional call it tragedy of the commons, the main view is that I have to give up something for humanity. Humanity needs to be saved. And so I have to do a good deed. I have to reduce my CO2 emissions. That's a cost to me because it's so easy kind of just to not take, not care. Uh, and all the benefits go to humanity. So that's why we can only act once we all agree to act. Tragedy of the commons. You know. uh, or the vice versa of tragedy of the commons is I get all the benefits from using the energy and all I can spread all the costs. And it's kind of this misalignment of incentives the reality we think is quite the opposite so we, we we push a totally different narrative we would say actually think about the word like this there's a big storm coming it's called climate change and resource constraints even in the best case there will be climate change the question how, how much even in the best case there will be resource constraints the question is how much because it's a, a misbalance so there's a storm coming of climate change and resource constraints What's the benefit of waiting, fixing your boat? Why are you not fixing your boat? To make it seaworthy for the storm that is going to come. It's not like a pandemic, the next pandemic may come or may not come. We know for sure like the, that it's totally measurable, the storm that's coming. And the good news is also if everybody repairs their boat, the storm will be much less. But think about your boat. And that's kind of the weirdness that we all do as first we have to have perfect global agreement 
before we can act. And I can tell you silly stories left and right of how that's the main doctrine so much that people don't even see it. I mean, we talk about it. And when, 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 when I go to parties and people know about my work, the people <gasps> shrivel away and say, oh my God, I know I should compost more. And I never talked with them about compost because it's all like this, this moralistic burden that people associate. But the story is quite different. I think it's more alike, like that we say, hey, cutting off your arm is not really helpful to you. And people say, oh, really? But that's what we learned in business school. No, but if you cut off your arm, it's actually more difficult to live. You know, it's, happy, it's useful to have an arm. Oh, what an interesting idea. You know, so I think we don't recognize to what extent it's totally in our essential self-interest to act like that. And, and the, perhaps the one tragedy is that we think self-interest, the negative word, is part of capitalism and selfishness and uncooperativeness. But in, in the end, it's really about, do you feel that you have skin in the game? It's about your life. Are you going to be ready? And by your being ready, it's also going to be much better for the world overall. So I think that's kind of the battle of these narratives. You could call it like tragedy of the commons. Like that's kind of the common. It's so common. It's like we're fish in the water. We don't even see the water. I mean, everything is like that. I mean, we can, we can talk about it. versus saying, well, actually, you have skin in the game. And I think the skin in the game conversation we see in the younger generation. So, for example, I mean, a very prominent person is Greta Thunberg. Uh, she is probably seen by my generation, the old generation, as a squeaky moral voice. And she's not. She is a total skin in the game voice because she doesn't say, hey, let's be nice to these distant Ethiopians or the Bangladeshis. Or She says, no, don't kill me. Why are you killing me? I don't want to be killed and my friends and the Bangladeshis, but you're killing me. And, 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 and so there's a totally different perspective. And so she, they answer differently when the journalists ask moralistic questions. Are you a vegetarian? So what are you doing? I mean, when we talk about financial crises, no journalist goes to the bank and say, what about your credit card? Have you always paid your debt? I mean, it's an irrelevant question. No, we've got to save the country from debt, you know, some, in the financial crisis. We don't talk like that. But with the par it's very parallel with the resource question. It's not... It's, it's not Oh, are you a nice person? No. I mean, it's going to, will you be able to operate? Will you be able to operate? What does it take to make your boat float? Because the storm is coming. It's that easy. You, you've actually touched on something. We've got, we've got to dive into it. So obviously you, you, you've touched on tragedy of the commons and, and kind of gone into explaining that. Specifically with your example of Greta Thunberg, is that she was in the United States. She took the boat trip <clears throat> there, got there, and, and uh, so glad. And then she was uh, with a bunch of other youth uh, kind of uh, before Congress or before representatives. There was Democrats and Republicans there. And it was, it was, uh, <laughs> awesome. how it, was it, it was, yeah, it was awesome, but it was also, uh, <laughs> it, was, it was crazy to watch because there was some interesting things. And there was something that happened there that was very similar to, to what you said, what, how media speaks to her, how, you know, the naysayers or whatever, which is, which was really interesting. Um, there was a, a Republican representative and uh, he wasn't asking questions, but the, the cameras were showing Greta Thunberg, the other <laughs> youth, they were showing this Republican <laughs> representative and he, he was on his cell phone and it was an iPhone. It was an older iPhone, iPhone and he was on it and you could she was kind of smirking, getting some answers, doing his tweeting, whatever, with Donald Trump. And then there was the uh, a Democrat who was asking the question at the time, very thanking them for coming. Uh -huh. And it was it was very nice for why they were there. And then it came time for this Republican to, uh, to, to speak to her. And he basically, uh, rhetorical, negative, very um, awful type of question, but says, you know, the U.S. is doing really good. We've got mm. renewables. We're moving forward with this mm. and that. And and we're so squeaky. But we're not going to do anything else until the Chinese mm. do it, until yeah. the Chinese get on board and, and do that. What's with all the new coal power plants that they're doing there? And, uh, you know, it kind of came back with a ridiculous question to her. And she <laughs> says, well, you know, I'm not a diplomat. I'm not a politician. I'm, I, I, I have nothing to do with that. I really can't answer it. But it, is kind of giving the almost the blame to her and, and also mm -hmm. saying, no, we're not going to do anything until they 
yeah. or those it's guys do good. something. And and what what happened is uh, she she couldn't kind of answer the question, but she was very she's very passionate and and exactly like you said, there's she, she's in. I, I think she said something show. very interesting. I remember that. Yeah. Uh, like she she said, it's so interesting you mentioned that because in Sweden our politicians say exactly the same thing about the United States. <laughs> You know what? I think I think that's what she did say, but it, it was still kind of stifling. And guess what happened though? And the, or the, what most people didn't realize is the answer was right in front of her. The answer was right in front of us mm -hmm. all in the camera. That cell phone that he had was mm -hmm. made in China. And just shortly before that, that the U.S. Uh, shipping mm. their plastic and their waste to China was mm. stopped, mm. correct? Mm. It was stopped. Mm. They, China said, we're not going to take it anymore. And um, what she should have said is, yeah, it's okay for them. Um, it, it's not okay for anybody, but what it is, it's okay for you to get a cell phone and have your emissions and your waste and all that occur in China. And then you reap the benefits of that and then sit back and complain about it the environmental impacts that occur to produce your iPhone or whatever to, to process your waste occurs in China. And the impact uh, affects us all around the world because we're all on the same spaceship Earth. But those emissions and those uh, resource waste occurred in China in actuality and the poor wages to give you mm -hmm. that cheap cell phone. And, uh, you know, if you're going to say that it's, it's not until they do it, then don't buy their products. Don't buy stuff that's <laughs> made there. Don't ship your garbage there. And there's these narratives that, you know, let, let's be honest with each other that we just need to get into the realities of it. It's much more yeah. complex than that. Yeah. In, in our experience, China is much more attuned to these questions. I mean, there, there are the pressures of kind of, the, there's the, the wants of wanting kind of um, more comfortable lives and all these kind of things. I have a very interesting story around that. We had an, in, an intern from China. She actually, she finished high school here, like her parents sent her here, here to the United States to get a good education. And then she got a Berkeley degree. She did an internship with us. And she told me the following story. That's very interesting. In geography class when she was in high school in China they learned resources are really important we have to look after resources very carefully and let's use other countries resources first before we use ours because they're so valuable yeah that's and true. then you think that's cynical but I think I wish every country would educate like that because if you if you say it's so important that we should use other resources first. If everybody did that, <laughs> we would all make sure we're very careful with our resources. It's like with money. When you say, I mean, if you say, okay, spend your money, uh, but be careful with your money. And if somebody else's budget for, for paying it, then let's use the other people's budget. You know, so I mean, that's a logical thing with, with money. Everybody would say the resources, it's, it's, it's very parallel. China is, is, is interesting because culturally, it's one of the few zones that were not part of the big colonial empires. I mean, parts of China were colonized, the Japanese went there, that the Europeans went there, et cetera, drank like the harbor cities and all these kind of things. Um, but as, as a country, that the, the, their thinking, their social sciences, their economics is based in a very different tradition than the West that has deeply ingrained like colonial spirit in the its economic things like we just take resources from somewhere else and then uh, and so so the, the way resources are being dealt with in the social sciences in the western hemisphere particularly since world war ii i think because our inability to kind of reconcile with the colonial formal like the former colonial past of the western hemisphere just kind of denied the whole resource side. If you look at economic textbook about development today, and you look up in the index about resources, you may find the word resources if you're lucky. And then it will go, go to the chapter that is called the resource curse. So what, what we still learn today in Western universities, <laughs> is that resources are a curse. Those countries that have a lot of resources, <laughs> You know, they're cursed by that because it will fuel corruption and people will be lazy. Look at Switzerland, where I'm from. Look at Switzerland. They have no resources and look at all the money they have because they have to work hard. I've been to many countries. I don't think in Switzerland they work hardest. You know, that's not the reason. So, so, so it's this kind of super biased 
against against resources so deep in latin america the development doctrine is called el derecho al desarrollo it means the right to develop and it's a code word for saying let's use up all our resources and then we make money with that and then we will be like the swiss i mean it's just absurd to the nth degree we had a very interesting conversation that was a long time ago actually it was 10 years ago in, in ecuador and that's just kind of to, to bring that into the picture again between kind of the noble and kind of we call it the noble narrative versus the necessary uh, narrative back then it was under the kyoto regime the kyoto regime called some countries annex two and they were lower income countries they say oh you don't have to worry about this you know, this is kind of this is just for high income countries, which already said, oh, it's a luxury problem. <laughs> but actually, countries that have low financial means, not to be resource secure, not to have the wrong resource requirements, that's most deadly for them, even. So it's kind of this the, the strange thing. Anyhow, they were an annex two country. And so so we showed them, you can go to our website at data.footprintnetwork.org, you can click on Ecuador, you will see that in 1960, they had five times more Ecuador than what they consumed, five times more. By now, these two lines have come together, just 50 or 50 plus years. When they saw these lines, some economists said, you must be against the right to develop. You are contra el derecho al desarrollo. And we said, not at all. We are totally for development, but we are against el derecho al colapso. We are against the right to collapse. Okay, what does that mean? Yeah, because you're, I mean, when you don't have the resources, I mean, where do you, where do you have the money to get the resources from in a world that is an overshoot already? And so they saw that and they put in their national development agenda, getting out of an ecological deficit as a priority. They didn't succeed yet because they're so oil dependent that they continue to make quick money by selling resources but they start to recognize this is not just a nice thing to do for others this is an essential piece for us not because we gave them money or we had political sway or there were demonstrations in the street or there was anything they just reckon wow yeah that's what we need to do i think that's a bit the hope for me that actually once people start to recognize wow yeah it's about my boat that's the shift. I think the most powerful thing we can do as individuals, as academics, as, as NGOs, or kind of to shift the world is helping people see aligned inc incentives where they now see conflicting incentives. Now, I think that our whole story is conflicting incentives. Oh, we should, it would be nice. Oh, we have to commit, make the CEOs commit. All that language reinforces the narrative that we should wait with action until we have full agreement. That's a noble deed. A noble deed costs us. And a noble yeah, deed we action. may do on Saturday afternoon. Rather than saying, this is existential. If you don't get your boat right, if you don't get your act together, you'll go down with others, but you'll go down. Yeah, that's, that's that that old and new world view, and really that it, what you're really getting into is the noble narrative that really means mm. nothing. It's it's a noble number, it's a noble goal, it's a noble statement, but it has no teeth. It doesn't mean a thing. It means we're going slower in the wrong direction, or even doing it's very, inaction. Yeah, it's, it's pernicious. It's, it's, it's always pernicious. someone else. Yeah. It, but there's this necessary narrative that we really <laughs> need to align mm. ourselves with and get into. And you gave the perfect mm. uh, perfect. And, and I wouldn't even say need to align. I think we want to align. It's in your own interest. I mean, it's like, it's like when you think about betting. If you understand the word better, your, your bets are more likely to succeed. You know, it's just kind of be better informed. So it's not, do you believe in climate change or not? Who cares? But I mean, it's like, like what's the likelihood? Like, when, how do you want to structure your bets? You know, so... Of course, we, we don't know how tomorrow is. I don't know if there's gravity tomorrow because tomorrow hasn't happened yet. I think the likelihood is very high. I would bet on there will be gravity tomorrow and that probably will win the bet, you know? So so, so it's, it's not about do you believe. Believe has no place in science. It's not about believe and not believe. It's about yeah, probability. You say it in your book so eloquently a couple of times. Um, it's like... Uh, flying a plane without instrumentation, fl uh, flying a plane without a fuel gauge, knowing how much mm. fuel you have left. And really, um, 
you even talk about food in your book as well, but what's the basic energy source for our body's food? Well, wouldn't it be good to know that we're going to have enough food and be able to maintain our body temperature and keep our motor running? Or are we just going to leave that up to someone else? And hopefully we'll have some food in the future. And and it's really that same, that same way of uh, not changing the narrative, (laughs) but also kind of connecting ourselves with the world. So um, I would have many funny stories to tell about countries, how they fight even the idea. And I don't understand, like, why would you fight wanting to have a fuel gauge on your plane? I mean, FAA wouldn't allow flight places to fly that have no, no gauge. I mean, it's, 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 it's so ridiculous ridiculous in some ways and and so anyhow but i mean this ridiculousness is also opportunity because i think how can we make this ridiculousness apparent it's not it's not and and but i think it's, it is this moral shield that people are so squirmish about the idea that oh my god it's so bad i'm so sorry and they can't even hear the possibilities so this year we will actually <clears throat> we always calculate overshoot day as, as close to reality as possible because things shift over time. You talked about like last year, particularly in Q2. So, so, so the, that, those, those, the, the month, how's it called? Yeah, second, uh, quarter April, se- se- second quarter of the year. Second quarter of the year. There was a very significant drop of resource demand. And then things inched up again at the end of the year. So we calculate just for the first part of the year, how much consumed compared to, uh, the year and that was a, a significant drop just because of that shock and the thing is i think what maybe not enough understood the regenerative future will come whether you like it or not it will come that's the, that's the only it's the only physical option because overshoot will end it will end it, it's like you cannot overuse your bank account forever it will be empty at one point you know <laughs> sorry <laughs> It's called math. Anyhow, so, so the only question or the only choice we have is really, do we want to do it by design? So it's on our terms, or do we want to have it done by disaster? That's that's a choice. We call it like, we can have one planet prosperity, or you can have one planet misery. But choose is very hard choice, very hard. Oh, let me think. Oh, and 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 so 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 that's what we saw in, in 2020 with the epidemic. It was kind of, it pushed us by disaster and it pushes down now this year the story will be even a little bit kind of more boring that's why we have to start rethinking the story because as to some extent even those resource gains have vanished and we have suffered so we had disaster and suffering and not even made any progress oh my god what's the what's the silver lining here <laughs> and so so, so what, what, what do you do in the story but actually i think the silver lining is the fault fo- uh, silver lining is the following Things actually have happened. Things do happen all the time. We have been stuck at home. We may not see those things that happen around the world. There are, there are shifts. They may be too slow, but there are a lot of possibilities out there. So what we will do is kind of, uh, we will, that's not even announced yet. I just tell it to you for the first time. Yeah. Okay. Is, is that we, will, we will do 100 days of possibility after Earth Overshoot Day. So because that's kind of the bridge from there to Glasgow. It's to say there's so many possibilities out there. If you want, what do you want? The question is not what should you do? The question is what do you want? All people born after 1985 will be in the workforce by 2050. If we have, want to have a chance of not to have runaway climate change, we should be out of fossil fuel use well before 2050. So in their professional life, in their professional life, they will have to see a transformation of, 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 a, of, a, of, a, of a size and scale that we haven't we haven't seen before. If you think about the iPhone, how quickly it developed, you know, that's kind of for the entire economy. It's, it's mind boggling, but it's also exciting. It's kind of building something totally new. Now, I think academic institutions have failed people and, and, and students today. They come out of university today and are clueless what to do uh, because the professors are clueless largely and, and, and are not honest about that they're clueless. The first thing like with uh, Alcoholics Anonymous is to acknowledge that you have a problem. I think it's, it's, it's times we don't know. I don't know how to do it, but I know we need to get her somewhere. And so we have to have a partnership with each other and, a, and an intergenerational partnership of saying, sorry, we totally effed up, you know, but, but we don't know. We tried and we don't know. And we want to help you. And you may have ideas and we are here to be mentors as we can help you. What do you need? What do you want? 
So because you'll be the captains of spaceship Earth and we, 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 our duty was to prepare you and we failed so far. And now we need to do it in kind of after, after class hours to kind of see, like help to help you to be the captain you need to be, you know? So, uh, so anyhow, so, so I think that's, and then I think that also brings this energy forward of recognizing there is possibility. What can we learn from the possibilities that exist? And it's quite dramatic and it's kind of, and, and, and I think the stunning thing for me is, I mean, how we have failed. And I think the so-called sustainability movement has utterly failed. And I'm part of that in terms of like, we had a conference in 1972 in Stockholm. Yeah, the first the time developed conference. environment came to, came together the Stockholm conference. And, um, and, and Indira Gandhi came there and everybody, and they had a very clear byline or, 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 or um, I say summary lines. They call it only one Earth. Now, how much clearer do we need to be? Only one Earth. Then we move to the to twenty years later to the Rio Conference, and before that, sustainable development was kind of defined the way I can tell you the legal thing. You need a lawyer to understand what it means. Meeting the needs of the present generation without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. How many people understand what that means? And, and, and I mean, it's, it's, and, and so and we don't even say environment anymore. Like we don't, give, we don't recognize the physical context and then we move on. And now we have the best computer models and everything. And now we talk about sustainability. It's, it's so confused. People don't even realize that we need, that we are biology, that we live of regeneration and we talk about sustainable growth and all kinds of funny things. And, and it's, I mean, the confusion is incredible. And we don't want, and then you don't want to measure. And it's oh yeah, oh yeah, we have to bring in everything, and then we measure everything, and because we don't want to look at the hard things, so we can say oh we have measured 175 things, and 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 three of them are really bad, and but on on five on 15 we have done really well, and it's complicated. Trust us, we are experts. I mean, give me a break. It's not that complicated. We have one planet, and the question is like. <laughs> How big are we? That's the underlying question. If you're not willing to face it, it's like the, the architect who says, I don't want to think about gravity. I mean, it's just, it's, it's. Yeah, it's, it's not, insanity. It's, we're, we're really fighting against e each other or we're, we've got uh, so many politicians and people who we're actually aligned in some ways as activists, yeah. environmentalists, mm -hmm. just as human beings. But then we're kind of like almost working against each other on this planet in many different ways. You and I both uh, kind of cross paths many times, know each other from mm -hmm. the Club of Rome Planetary Emergency mm -hmm. Group. Um, uh, you, you're mm -hmm. all, quite active in, in the group as well and have done many things. But that really um, kind of leads in to where I want to go because I want to quickly get through the beginnings of how this journey evolved for you, where this thinking came from, how, how it evolved. Um, and then I want to go into much more depth and substance of how we can really move forward with our um, global hectare and uh, thinking and uh, ecological footprints to come up with some real strong solutions. And there's also some that are emerging. So the Club of Rome is, is a perfect starting point because books, the limit, the book, the limit mm -hmm. to growth. And there's been multiple books. So the second book was called beyond the mm -hmm. limits to growth. Mm -hmm. The third book was called the 30 year update, the limits to growth. Mm -hmm. um, and it's D Donella Meadows, Dennis Meadows, your granders, Steve mm -hmm. Barron's Jr. Um, were involved in that the world model three, which you kind of touched upon and in, in what you said, these computer modeling and, and different things. But how does that tie to to the journey that or does it fit into totally. your, yeah. your 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 way of thinking and how this evolved and then your PhD thesis to come up with this and 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 uh, give us a little bit more insight into the journey you've taken and yeah. what are some of the old wisdoms clear back from 1972 is when the first book came out um, to, to now. Mm -hmm. I mean, we all construct our stories possibly, but it, it, it really feels to me that it kind of, there are like three core elements that kind of put me on that path. That's the limits to growth. Yeah, the growth, right yeah. yeah. <laughs> Very cool. <laughs> so so um, one is that I just was extremely lucky and privileged that, that, that I grew up in Switzerland, um, 
that was surrounded by World War II. And the most brutal thing that happened to, to Switzerland, because very lucky to stay out of the war, was that it, it was, was the, the, the resource shortage, the food shortage, that Switzerland could only grow seven months of food um, <clears throat> per year. So in their 12 months, uh, you had to eat a bit less, and then you had to kind of build victory gardens, you know, like <laughs> the United States. And, and then Switzerland built a merchant fleet. Some of these ships were lost by submarines, etc. but they're trying to bring grains from South America to Switzerland. Anyhow, so it's very dramatic for, for, my, for, for my parents and grandparents' generation. So that story, and, and then uh, like vacations, the, the vacation that was fantastic on a farm. My grandfather had a house. Where we could spend vacations and there was a, I could help help you know <laughs> as a small child the farmer milking the cows spreading manure and just recognizing where food comes from and how 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 urban people look down on farmers and the farmers brought everything to the city and got nothing back I mean just the strange thing it's it's mirrored like how Switzerland such high income doesn't have resources and it's just weird it didn't make sense to me and, and, and particularly how then also the urbans this like look down on the on, on the on, on the rural people it was just so strange uh and and and, and i just love to be out there kind of like in in in, in kind of how, how farm work there's one thing the second thing was by 73 there was this oil crisis and Switzerland's heroic attempt to counter it was to have three car-free Sundays, maybe four. I think it was three. And for us kids, I was 11 years old. It was just amazing. We could bicycle on the highway. Like it was just suddenly we were free. It was the air was much better. It was not so noisy. We had so much fun. So it kind of it was a shock. I realized, wow, the world will have to change, and it will be so great. So my emotional relationship a fossil fuel free future was incredibly positive because I thought that that what has to happen and I, I hated kind of the concrete the paving over like oh my god it's so ugly and you know like the nature's getting paved over and so the idea of this better future was actually very inspiring perhaps for my parents or grandparents it was more scary the idea but for me it was like uplifting and the third thing was I was a very lazy reader and so my father was very con concerned about that so he read me books and and then one book that came out was limits to growth and he was kind of he was very taken by that as well and I had more of a mathematical mind that, that kind of liked numbers more and then seeing graph I mean I don't know if you have seen limits to growth it's super primitive graphics you know but the first computer graphics is kind of with with, with, with letters <laughs> that go yeah, across so the page I, and, and I said, oh. and before books had only kind of mm. words and that was like one of the first books that actually also had graphs in there and numbers and and i was really taken by that and wow over my lifetime things could change like that and computer model so limits to growth was super influential in my kind of like upbringing and kind of also professional choice i thought okay i want, want to become an engineer that builds a renewable economy um uh, and then i mean the amazingness that then through that like these were like limits to growth i was like the rock star book you know and then i got to know most of the authors, uh, Donella, unfortunately, she passed away. She was yeah. amazing, and um, and and York and, and Dennis, both very very kind friends. Like, so, wow, you can become friends with your rock stars. You know, it's it's amazing. <laughs> uh, so so very influential. And and then when we start when I started a PhD, and like when we looked at kind of this whole question of how do we bring the idea of caring capacity or the limited capacity of the plant, how to make that actionable um one key insight from studying limits to growth and how it was, was was received is to be very adamant about being descriptive rather than producing forecasts because forecast because as we don't know if the, if there will be uh, gravity tomorrow we know for sure nothing about the future and so philosophically you can always deconstruct any argument if you don't like it you just say oh we don't know if there will be gravity tomorrow and it's an unwinnable argument you know it's not the unsettleable argument <laughs> to, oh maybe there will be this in the future so you can, you can never you can never settle that argument and so it stays open and nothing happens so we say no we just account we just document what is and we still were accused of being like limits to growth we have nothing to do with forecasts <laughs> It's just accounting, but it's just because people are so much stuck in, in, in their views. So yeah, limits to growth, super influential and, and, and we learned about it a lot. Uh, learned from it a lot, how to position ourselves. And still, progress is incredibly slow. I mean, that's kind of when I have not worked on it for 30 years on this specific topic. I mean, I was interested before, but then the footprint started about 30 years ago. 
and uh, on some level it's kind of mind-boggling that kind of the term now it's kind of a common term but it's also mind-boggling how little impact it has made on thinking i mean it's kind of just i could go on and on in terms of like the plastics bottles that i see of the company saying we are reducing our ecological footprint in every flight magazine that i'm on like there's something about footprint and it, it's kind of told in the most meaningless way possible <laughs> Yeah. So, we're so, we're so, going to get into that just, too. So I think we're going to take the <laughs> take this our conversation over a little bit because we're definitely going to get into that. In, in your book, you you talk you're you're not biased to anybody. You're really you want to give the footprint and calculations and help people with uh, people, cities, countries, individuals with with the tools and the understanding how to do the calculations, how it works, and what the global hectare is. And so you have examples. I think there was one example. Um, there's, I mean, there's numerous examples throughout the book, but one is the United Kingdom in 2000. Uh, I think you 300 times um, the the footprint size of uh, the London. size. Yeah, London, London uses uses a footprint that's about, I think, yeah. roughly 300 folds larger than the yeah. area of London. Of course, exactly. yeah. I mean, cities. They don't produce yeah. their food, and you know, so yeah. London exactly. And then, <laughs> and and then the the one where I have the bookmark is you're uh, real positive about the new model of development in China, and there's just a lot of things in there that we we don't think about, we don't put into perspective, especially when we're with the blinders in in the city, living in London. If we're in the middle of it, sometimes we just don't realize, and, and especially with the way. The world was before the pandemic. Many of us were running around from job to job, uh, and and we were focusing on just surviving almost instead of the the bigger picture. Now I, I think a lot more people have taken a step back or had hopefully used the time well to have a little more reflection on on the bigger picture. One thing that kind of just got swept under the rug that mm -hmm. that I want to mention before we go into some deeper stuff is right before the pandemic hit, Australia. 2019, 2020 was still extreme brush fires, extreme fires. Um, they were saying worse than atomic bombs, you know, I, I, they were saying equivalent to worse than 650,000 atomic bombs going off during that time. That is that they saying 1.2 billion tons of CO2 emitted just in the time of those fires. Um, 530 million tons were just in one month. Um, uh, which is, uh, or 530 million tons is the annual normal requirement, but 19 million hectares were lost in one month of fires. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Blue Mountain World Heritage Site lost 85,000 hectares in one month, 3 billion wild animal species during that time, 3 billion, I can't even fathom that number, 3 billion, I, I, I didn't even know that we, you know, <laughs> it was so abundant, 7 billion tree species, I didn't even know there was 7 billion tree species, um, and just from the Australia fires, and that's, you know, very country, local, island, uh, so to say, and it, it, it just went by the wayside, yeah, we saw the kangaroo and the koala photos, and we heard a, a little bit about it, but then came the pandemic and it was just like it's, it was forgotten. But that was definitely an overshoot of resources from natural uh, issues, but also because of the way we were using resources, the way that it's got warmer and warmer because of climate change and many other things. So there, there, there's that, you know, that you spoke in August, 2020 about uh, fires in, in, in California and also uh, what was the other Brazil was the other location I think Brazil, um, yeah. I, yeah you were speaking about that we, 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 we did some, we, 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 we yeah I mean just that's more kind of to illustrate as well I mean we, we did a very rough analysis because the numbers are not as easily available or, or as robust but just roughly to see to what extent because Australia people say, we, we compare the countries footprint you can compare it to a lot of things you can say okay if everybody lived like australians how many planets would it take you know uh several you could look it up on data.footprintnetwork.org but then you can also say how many australians does it take and because australia is so large 
their footprint typically is smaller than their buy capacity. Um, so overall, from a, if you look at it from a consumption perspective, but in that year, because of the forest fires, if you actually include that and say, what was the net buy capacity for that year? It was much, much smaller. I mean, it's conceivable that you could have negative buy capacity in a year. If you like, if you burn more than kind of like, because it takes many years for forests to grow up, you could actually lose in a year, like more than it's being regenerated. Then you'd have a negative buy capacity. But it, it, so, so our rough estimate came to the conclusion that the buy capacity of Australia cut compared to the normal kind of what we saw in, in, in an average year was about half. So it went to half. And that meant for the first time, Australia was actually running an ecological deficit. But it is pretty stunning for like the country that seemed like massively, like massively resource rich because of that, actually for that year. Yeah, it, so, it, it, yeah. We, we, so, so we it, kind it, of it, totally forget it, about some of those things that are going on, and it's going on all over the world. I mean, the 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 rainforest burning in in Brazil um, uh, ties to politics. Bolsonaro allowing things yeah. and companies and corporations. Then we, you know, uh, another thing with uh, whether you uh, group it into colonialism or not. But the Brexit and then the lockdown mm. and all the, the the decisions on that a lot of lot had to do with race and, and food workers, migrant food mm. workers, not only grocery stores but clear to mm. the farm workers that now were locked out of uh, uh, the mm. United Kingdom and mm. because of that there was no workers to take the job. You think okay because of the Brexit and we all had this great vote that now all those jobs would go to to people in mm -hmm. the United Kingdom to fill those positions that uh, they were it's, worried yeah, about. It's, it's quite it's quite funny this idea of independence on in, in some level because we I mean if you look at the UK as a whole and there was like this commission very academic commission on looking at the, nat the natural capital commission looking at the natural capital they missed three quarters of the natural capital they used because if you look at the demand of the UK it's about four times larger than what UK's ecosystems can renew. And then we should go even a stop a step further. Like how many planets would actually be good to be used? You know, so 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 getting Earth overshoot day to December 31st is probably not kind of the, the ultimate goal because we are in competition with other species. I mean, the fish that a seal eats, I cannot eat, and vice versa. So so EO Wilson. He, he, he made this kind of bold proclamation to say, wow, maybe we should use half Earth. So then it's just half the planet, you know, so uh, because the others need food as well. That would allow about 85% of the biocapacity to be maintained, not 100%, but 85%. Uh, and that, if you use half, it will also be good for climate change. Now we use globally about 1.6 fold. So we 60% faster, we withdraw than it's being regenerated. And uh, probably a better level would be half. So that's about three times less. Many people, when we say we use 1.6 planets, say, that doesn't make any sense that you just use up the planet that's gone. Oh, you said Earth overshoot day was on August 22nd, but I opened the fridge on August 23rd and there was still beer in my fridge. And what's, what's going on? And so, yeah, okay. <laughs> it's like yeah. in a bank account, if you use more, then the interest being paid or deposited is there's still money in the bank. You know, it's good. we're just we're, we're depleting, we're depleting the stock, and you can do that for some time. But now we see how tight it is. I mean, there's no there's no carbon budget left. And I think that's kind of something we're not honest enough. I think I mean, if just a basic, basic, basic science of climate change, you can do that. The models, the, the thermodynamic equilibrium models of saying if you had, like. How much climate gas can you have? How much greenhouse gas can you have in the atmosphere to get to a two degrees warmer average world? You don't even need to know about distribution. I mean, it's kind of this, it's, a, it's the simplest way of calculation. You don't need to understand transition. Just kind of in the end, like what's the equilibrium temperature with, for, for, what, for what PPM? So IPCC said back in 2014, with 450 PPM CO2 equivalent, we have a 66% chance not to exceed two degrees. So 450 ppm CO2, parts per million CO2, give us only a 66% chance not to exceed two degrees. If you, if you take the US measures currently from Hawaii, you know, to on, on what, the, what the current ppm level is, 
in CO2 equivalent, we are at 500. Today at 500. 450 is not even adequate for Paris. We are at 500. There's no budget left, really. And then we say, oh, there will be net sequestration in the future. From where? I mean, I, of course, I mean, there, I mean, there are lots of possibilities. I'm not saying it's not possible, but that takes huge effort and may compete with food production. It may not if you're very careful if you shift agriculture. But I mean, that just shows that the, 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 the magnitude that actually, even though we've had overshoot and they'd say, oh, nothing has happened. Actually, a lot has happened. The a debt lot. we have accumulated is very significant. And to, to build down that debt, to pay back that debt, which would mean, for example, getting the CO2 out of the atmosphere again. That would that takes significant effort, and and so I think the and, and the time lag. Oh, it's about time lag. It's not that big of a time lag if you think about how long do houses last, how long do roads last, how long do power um, power plants last. If you compare those time spans with how quickly climate change and resource constraints are emerging, or the fact that we need to be out of a fossil fuel economy within like 30 years. These 30 years are much shorter than the lifespans of most of our physical investment. So if we continue to invest today, I mean, we should have obviously started earlier, but today to invest in things that have no future, we invest in our own demise. That's why it's so hard for me to understand the German commitment to, to continue to build out the natural gas yeah, it's, infrastructure. Uh, it's insanity it's from my insanity. perspective. Yeah. It's insanity. Yeah, or, or I mean, and, and even like like the kind of this, 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 like circular thinking logic in Switzerland, people are very proud of that we are incinerating our waste. Now, waste in Switzerland has less carbon intensity, uh, has, has more carbon intensity. So it's, like, it's more carbon per kilowatt hour produced than coal. It would be much better to burn coal and put the garbage in the coal mines. Not that, that that is a good idea, but it just comes to show how grotesque our thinking is. Uh, of the, oh, it's, it already existed. It's just waste. It's burning the waste. It's a good thing. I mean, it's just so. So so we are so far off from recognizing what it mean, what regeneration actually means. And this is a basic thing. It's not. It's not that complex. A child knows. You know. They're, they're, well, uh, with Earth overshoot, with global footprint, what we're so it's ecological footprint, but we're really talking about economics quite a bit. Economics yeah. is the major factor, and um, there's you know there's a couple more that we we need to talk about. Herman Daly, mm -hmm. eighty two, I think he's eighty two years old now. But he wrote this book. Matter of fact, he wrote a couple of books. I've got them right Many, here. Sorry, well. the early 70s. So, yeah. Uh, 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 ecological economics. Yeah. Uh, here's sure another one. They're academic mm -hmm. books uh, as well. Very thick. Good reads. Super guy. Used to be with the World Bank and that. Um, was some of those influence to you as well? I absolutely. Like yeah, I, 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 yeah. Yeah. I, I, I only got to know Her, uh, Herman Daly's writing. Um, once I went to Canada to study, I didn't know him in Europe um, back then. So I went to Canada in 89. And that's one of the, the, the few, and that was like mind blowing for me kind of to, to read because I, mean, I wasn't courses about, I mean, I was very skeptical, like the whole growth idea. And then and, and I had courses with uh, professors like just um, on that. There were some that were interested in kind of new ways of thinking about economics, but I didn't know about Herman Daly and that he put it so clearly and so simply. Um, and 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 it cost him his economic career. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he, he was he, not he was he was not able to yeah. find a position in any economics department ever after, and it's quite stunning. Yeah, but I mean the same. When you when you your father read the limits to growth to you're probably uh, mm -hmm. as well above ten years of age or so. But yeah. in the beginning of of um, the limits to growth. So much controversy, so much pushback, not just from economists, but uh, many politicians. There, were, it was a controversial, a lot of pushback, and then it took about ten years when they did the second version of beyond the limits to growth, mm -hmm. because at that time we'd already gone beyond the limits. That finally people said, "No, this 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 isn't that controversial." It's those who 
are, are looking at old economic models and looking at old ways of thinking that, that, that are giving the pushback. Um, you received the uh, Kenneth Boulding Award, but this yeah. is from him and his wife. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, the future. Awesome. And, um, you know, it's a crazy title, the future. Mm -hmm. But the, the, the interesting thing is, okay, let's talk sustainability. You, you said sustainability in, in the beginning and the legal definition, that's hard to understand and to grasp. For me, there's uh, there's in the UN where I, I'm at a lot. There's 17, probably at least seven solid definitions of sustainability, but it has no no teeth. There's no. Uh, Are you talking about no, the ones you're wearing on your? This shirt? is the sustainable development goals. <laughs> the development no, goals. just I about the 17. Term, uh, the term yeah, again. I just happened yeah, to be the also 17. 17. Development. <laughs> <laughs> but but for me, sustainable is really about the three pillars of. Mm -hmm. One, a deep understanding of economics. So not just mm -hmm. the bad economic models, mm -hmm. extractive capitalism, on and on, mm -hmm. but ecological economics, a solid mm -hmm. understanding of what economic models will work for us best in the future. Yeah. Second is those positive sustainable innovations, if you can even say that, that will help shift humanity get humanity into a better situation of not being so extractive being more efficient not doing harm on human health and and environmental destruction and so on and then the third is really you know people say well, mark you say sometimes you're a sustainable futurist or a resilient futurist what what the hell does that mean you're we thought you were a tree hugger environmentalist <laughs> activist or what does that have to do with the future well it has everything to do with the future mm -hmm. because to to you're trying to think how can what models or what what roadmap can we take to ensure that we even make it to the future and what will those futures look like most of the models economic models are the models that we have today let's just do a, a mental experiment or experiment and push those models out into the future 10 years 20 30 40 50 years out in the future how are they working for humanity is there a crash it goes back to that world model three you know mit limits to growth Let's put those in those models into practice and push them out, uh, e even through scenarios into the future. Are they still working for us in the future? They're not. Most of our economic models that we've had in the past, I think I've lived through five bubbles. You've probably lived through more more bubbles. We have these economic bubbles, and mm -hmm. you know you hear you hear as they're coming. Oh, we're facing a bubble, and then what happens when the bubble? bursts or collapse. Well, we have a bailout. If you're the US, we have a lot of bailouts. The Netherlands had the big tulip bubble, the the uh, the finance, uh, tulip mm -hmm. uh, economic yeah. bubble. But mm -hmm. these, when these bubbles burst, the damn thing is, as we go back to Einstein's problem mm -hmm. theory, we go right back to the same broken mm -hmm. model and hope I think that it's, it's, it's going to be fixed. It, it's, it's even worse than the bubbles because bubbles could just be a little bit of overheating and kind of like, like, like waves. But actually, we are, we are running a school book Ponzi scheme. It's a school book Ponzi scheme. It's, I'm not meaning it as an analogy. I'm meaning it as an actual. A Ponzi scheme is if you use the future to pay for the present. So in a Ponzi scheme, you pay the present investors by scamming the future investors. And then like, so then you expect, as long as you can expand <laughs> the investment base. So that's what we're that's what we're doing ecologically. So no Ponzi scheme doesn't end. I mean, it 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 it, it, it it's, it's not possible. So, so it will end. So how do you deal with Ponzi schemes? First, you need to recognize them. Then those who actually get out early are better off. They lose less. You know, so getting out early is not that. So it's not a tragedy of the commons either. It's actually very helpful to recognize that you're in a Ponzi scheme and end it as quickly as possible. So I don't fully understand the advantage of not doing that um, and and not not recognizing it and how we don't how everything. Oh, this is an extreme view of saying we're in a Ponzi scheme. But I mean, tell me tell me what's not Ponzi scheme. I mean, this is this. So the Ponzi scheme is, you know, it's just an overheating. It's actually just we're building on liquidation. Yeah, uh, I don't know what else we have to add. Now, you know? Yeah, no, we, we've got we, we've got plenty more to add. So in your book, you also talk about some some real some real good models that uh, or some ways of thought. You know, this 
well, one planet living from bed Z and we see it mm -hmm. in other examples. I'm working on, on one. Um, mm -hmm. uh, it's called Neom. It's a new city project. Neom. In oh, yeah, yeah. Saudi Arabia. Yeah. 175. Whether that will be something that really comes out and, and, and proper, we don't know, but we hope uh, that it has that. There, uh, to, to focus more in, uh, we've got extractive economies. We've got, um, you know, uh, the donut economics. I've got Kate yeah. Rowworth's book right here. You also mentioned that in your book. Um, we've got um, Mariana Matsukato is kind of a yeah. mixture uh, of that and, and uh, other economics. And there, there are so many different types of economic models that, that we've gone through, that we have, that uh, circular economy, ecological economics, uh, which uh, also comes from Herman Daly, which is steady state economy, mm -hmm. also an old model of John Stuart Mill. Uh, over a hundred years ago. And now there's these, and I don't know if it can be considered an uh, economic model, but uh, Johan Rockstrom, uh, Stockholm Resilience Institute, Potsdam Institute, mm -hmm. this planetary boundaries, which boundaries, is really yeah. ties to Kate Rowworth as, as well with her donut economics. And I, I want to know, because I, I'm a big fan, I'm a believer, I, you've got me on board. I think that the ecological footprint, I think the global hectare is, is my ecological economics. I think that is the best model for me. And I, I, I want to uh, get crazy with you in a minute and kind of uh, talk about some ideas that I've had and if you've awesome. thought about them as well. But before we get in that, I want to address, does your global hectare, does ecological footprint fit into the donut economics, circular economy. Totally. Totally. Do you see that they're tightly integrated, or do you think that they, these models are kind of going off in a different direction? So, in your book, Johan Rockstrom gives you a nice um, mm -hmm. kind of a, a, a prelude. But I've taken his planetary boundaries course, and he he kind of says, he mentions you, he mentions Herman Daly, he mentions uh, John Stuart Mill, he, he mentions uh, the limits to growth, but then he kind of says, but those weren't all accepted, or the, you know, here's planetary boundaries. And so we have this problem, not only in the Club of Room group, within the UN, the World Economic Forum, that we're fighting against each other. We all want to come up with our own system, instead of saying, there are the system's already there. It's been there since 1972. Let's put it to use instead of just using it as, as a measurement tool. Let's apply this as an economy, the new economy that goes on for the future. And so I want to know any of these models question, that I yeah. just mentioned, the books, are yeah. you working with them? Are you moving towards that? Or, or, or do you see they're going to emerge mm -hmm. as new? I mean, was it Amsterdam that's kind of applied yeah. the donut economics? Yeah, right. I want to know what your thoughts and 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 where's that going? Mm -hmm. it's, it's a it's a very very good topic overall. So so I I personally think there's only economics, you know, and and so because it's economics is just thinking about how do we interact with each other, how do we allocate resources, and then there are theories within economics are kind of presumptions, and some of them turn out to be not so. Greater numbers are better. Ecological, I mean, we shouldn't call it ecological economy. That should be only. I mean, economics is not ecological economic, is not economics from my perspective. So, so 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 I think the big premise is to say we have to recognize the economy as a subsystem of the biosphere. Sorry, you know. And so anything that is not, I mean, could not be legitimately called economics. So 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 so, so it's not like bodies of whole theories and so we, we approach things very differently um, it, but i think so then this kind of the, the ones that are more sustainability oriented we know each other i mean it's kind of i uh, this is a bit of a tragedy of kind of you have to like most of them come out of their own kind of think tanks etc we have to find our own funding and so you have to do so so collaboration is not that easy often because the funding is not available to collaborate well. So we are, we are trying to do it. I mean, our organizations that we put network in the organization always work with others, through others. Um, and, uh, and and just sometimes, so for example, we're very friendly with Johan Rockstrom, 
but we have never been able to to work together. I think there would be tremendous synergies that if we actually work together closely. But then, just if the funding structures are not available, it's just it's hard to. I mean, you can have coffee together, but that's you know. So that's that's a bit of a piece of a tragedy that we haven't done it more now. In, in terms of many of the tools out there, I, I think I feel I feel like the planetary boundaries is one of the most significant cousins or brothers or sisters or whatever you want to call them in some ways they approach the systems a bit different i mean they, they, it's, it's more kind of an ecological model but i think it's very aligned the, the, the big alignment is they we both see biology is the big thing and that actually with the functioning of the ecosystems and not to overwhelm the ecosystems now we framed it a little bit differently planetary boundaries looks at the more ecological systems how they interact with each other and how like the nitrogen cycle and biodiversity and all these kind of things how that work we look at regeneration and i would just say that the planetary boundaries are kind of items or kind of or, or, or components or, or, or conditions parameters or the economists would call production factors that produce regeneration so if you don't have the like if if if, if this if, if this nine areas that are compromised then you compromise the overall outcome of regeneration so that's kind of how it then how it fits together that the we are not we're not explaining how the world operates and how the various things kind of hit each other but in the end there's the outcome of regeneration so the so what we can offer then in addition like the binary boundary is great to understand the global system it's not that great to to scale it down to different pieces you know so for example a country so how do you cut down the water to one country but actually regeneration you can because we look at the country as if it was a farm you know so so you can look at in the end how much regeneration happens within your farm and of course there are people say oh there are boundaries you cannot cut the environment in pieces you cannot cut but there are farms and if the cow is on your side of the farm fence i have to pay for the milk you know and then if it's on my side of the fence i can milk the cow without payment you know <laughs> so 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 by capacity the territoriality of it is a way of kind of thinking about like who has access to which part of the bio capacity and it's in the end it is bio capacity that we live from and all these aspects are somehow competition for bio capacity so anyhow so i think that this just to say the synergy so there would be much much more that we can do and I would love to do that. And I regret that we haven't been able to find resources to do that together because I think we could we could leap big bounds. You know? So now in terms of, of, of the donut economy, again, donut economy, I think is, it's a wonderful way of kind of getting people excited and showing the absurdities yeah, yeah, the absurdities. Yeah, book, yeah. Economy. The donut, yeah. The, the and, and so that's what have, has been our lemma since the very beginning. That we say, how can we thrive? within the limits of nature you know so that's kind of that that's the big tension i think rather than saying sustainability i find that much more helpful to say what's the soccer game you're looking at one it's we want to live well and there's only so much planet how do we deal with that conflict and that's what kate also put put down so well i think the brilliance of of, of kate's work is two things one is to make that story very visual but a good name donut you know donut is kind of funny because donut is not healthy so it's kind of oh and it's round it's easy to see and and it and it, it brings together so again like when you just say how can we live well within the means of one planet sounds a bit boring but you say oh this is like not having enough and using too much and so this is donut you know so that's kind of and so so visually it's really attractive it's a great symbol it brings things together it focuses the second piece of brilliance i think and that i don't know how kind of or if it does that's a resonate but i think it's a very important part is she didn't put numbers down and so so because numbers are answers and answers kill inquiry and i think that's something that we have felt like by putting a number down that people feel it's uncomfortable then they start to, then you start to kind of kill the messenger you know so it's, it's kind of so so i just think by staying conceptual uh that's i think that's that's very important so we had we did something quite similar still do but we compare and i think it's in the book as well we compared the human development index which is basically an approximation of well-being you can say against then how many plans does it take to support it so we can actually make we can turn the 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 donut into exact numbers <laughs> uh, yeah. but then the numbers cre create conflict and so that that i think was a major barrier for us i think there are applications i think we, we talk about one planet prosperity i don't know if you have seen the work we've done with schneider electric to basically say 
if you really want to think about what does sustainability or whatever regeneration, whatever you want to use as a name, what does this conflict between wanting to live well and planetary constraints, that's a long way of saying it, how we're going to call it, how, what does that mean for businesses? And the, the, the sad part is it has become CSR or kind of this ESG battle or kind of all these commitments to whatever, rather than saying, actually, what does it mean? And, and we, we make a very, very, very simple premise. That's why we, where we use this, this, this diagram as well to say, actually, it's so simple. It's so simple. If you as a business don't deliver things that humanity needs to succeed, your market will shrivel. If you offer things that humanity needs to succeed, that will be helpful for you. Now, it doesn't guarantee your success. It's like playing soccer downhill. It's easier. There may still be Messi on the other side or Ronaldo playing against you, but it's easier on average playing downhill soccer than uphill soccer. You know, so, 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 that, so how do you know as a company whether you deliver something that humanity needs? You, make, you take this HDI footprint diagram, which is kind of a, just a more mathematical way of the donut, and you can, you can make a dot of your clients and say, is it helping your clients to move into sustainability quadrant? If it does, then it helps. If not, then you're kind of going to lose out. Uh, it's, 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 so it's, so it's, 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 it's very specific. And I think something, maybe that's also a good thing about the donut, you know, the donut has just three spaces. Just the inner space, the donut space, and the outer space. But actually, if you think about it mathematically, like kind of the human development and footprint, there are actually four quadrants. And it hides a bit the fourth quadrant. And maybe that's a good thing to get the conversation started, but it's the fourth quadrant that is the most challenging, the most difficult. In the donut picture, you could call it the, like the, the, the negative donut, <laughs> like if it's reversed. Yeah. The difficulty of that more and more are in the situation that makes it so challenging and so hard. More and more are in the situation where they don't have a great life and yet a level of resource consumption that is not replicable worldwide and that's like a mind blower like it's kind of wow so so and and, and so we're just about to bring out the paper and it's kind of the i mean it sounds more on the tragic side but it's why it doesn't get enough attention it's so amazing 72 percent of the world population now live in countries that have both an ecological deficit and you cannot always have that on average you know you cannot have that forever and they have less than world average income. They have both these conditions. So they don't have the resources in the long run, at currently even, or, or, you know, and they don't have the money to outcompete others to get them. 72% of the world population. And, and so, so it's kind of, so, so maybe that's too dark. I mean, but it, it, it's, it's just stunning to me. There's $150 billion being spent every year in international development. I mean, I don't know how useful or whatever, but, not to have resource security at the core of that effort is just fraudulent, I would say. Maybe it's too strong. No, it's not too strong of a word. It's the exact right word. It is fraudulent because it's anti-poor. It actually maneuvers people into a situation where they cannot be secure. It's, it's really dangerous. And, 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 and it's just the, the blindness is to, to that and that the development books that many economists that go into these institutions read and learn about resource curves and they still get quizzed on that for their exam is just disgusting yeah it is disgusting i don't know sorry for the rant. You, you're not <laughs> ranting at all i mean you're telling us about the the, the education model for the new economists uh, which has been outdated kate rollworth also that's, discusses that's awesome that like kate of, i think she's, she's a wonderful yeah like inspiring and, and so kind of to, to help people see where there's other opportunities now. So she, the way she talks about economics is like, we are more descriptive, you know? So, uh, so these are all tools. These are all tools that you need in, in real economics. This is all economics. <laughs> this is all economics. Yes. And there's many that call themselves economists that should be barred. Like, I mean, if you have to take a bar exam Absolutely. to be a lawyer. And, and so it's like malpractice, like, like or medical profession, it's malpractice. Yeah. Is that too harsh? Her, no, it's not. I don't know. No, I think no, it's, it's not. As a matter of fact, <laughs> Herman Daly, Daly said that as well. He said it said there it should should it should be illegal. E.O. E. Wilson said it as well. I mean, you talk mm -hmm. about it in your book. The a couple of things. So I mean, Ponzi the, schemes the, are illegal, typically. Yeah, they are. They are. And that's what it is. The in, in your um, calculation, in your measuring the data 
a lot comes from the U UN, but you mentioned one, you mentioned HDI, which is life expectancy, mm -hmm. literacy, per mm -hmm. capita gross national yeah. income, yeah, yeah. Uh, the place where they live. You, there's a world input output database, uh, WIOD. There's an yeah. MRIO, multi-regional yeah. input output data. And then yeah, the one you use a lot is the Global Trade Analysis Project as yeah. GTAP. GTAP, yeah, that's also, that's also for the from, MRIO, from, yeah. These are all kind of techniques, just kind of how yeah. to slice and dice the data but, sets, yeah. Mm. But but now with those data sets, or even more so what you just mentioned, there's you, you're you're I'm hearing this and I I understand, but I want to have it explained better and understand why why can't we tell people the numbers? Why can't we talk about? Yeah, we, we don't want to mention the number numbers or put the numbers on it be, because why? Because they bury their heads in the sand or they don't listen anymore. They're not interested. It's a shock factor of the realities uh, of where we're at because you said, you know, we, they, they don't have any numbers on it, no measurement on it. Is that because people can't see that? Or am I misunderstanding what you meant? Maybe by they can't. See, maybe they can't see a way out. I mean, that's I think that that's why I think the narrative is more than noble to necessary. They think it's just kind of or it's too shocking, and that they're people of of agencies that they just don't like to say. Well, they can't, they cannot say you use one point six Earth. That's you cannot say that. That like, I think it's so scientifically as robust as GDP, if not more. To say I like, think it's could, more and then we we so I mean we could go to a comparison of our accounts. Our we deliberately limit ourselves to UN data sets, not to look like we're picking data. And if countries say they have better data, then they it's your problem with the UN. It's not our problem, you know. So so get get it straight with the UN. <laughs> but but so yeah. so if the UN numbers are right and, and they are they're not as complete as they need to be. We can go into details. That probably what we do is an underestimate. That's another story. But in terms of I mean like. The, the Greece, I think they did once an adjustment of GDP and they realized it would have to change by 25%. I mean, there's so many, like money accounting is so much more complex because you need to understand the difference between value add and, and revenue and, you know, so, so our profit and revenue and, and, and the, or, 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 or imply costs and whatever. With the footprint, it's straight basic, like it's basic accounting. You eat a tomato, it took space to grow a tomato. Sorry, you know, I mean, and so, so everything can be, Translating global hectares is like putting everything into dollars. I, I once talked, it was actually interesting, a central banker in Colombia, and he was an agroeconomist before. So he had, he had kind of both, he was an agricultural minister before. So he knows agriculture, economics, etc. So I told him about the global hectares. And I said, the global hectares is like, it's like a currency. It's a physical currency that we can translate everything into in terms of like the ultimate budget. And this is the currency. And he said, Absolutely. And actually, it's the only currency that is not a fiat currency. Yeah. It's backed up by reality. Yeah. And, and I thought, wow, that's, that's a good line. <laughs> so that's the global hectare. It's a, it's, a, it's a currency backed up by reality. Um, so, now, I've noticed the trend over the years as far as the numbers go, which you say as well, uh, the a a Associated Press, the AP used to come out and they tell you the the replicable global hectare, which is now 1.6, mm -hmm. but then they tell you what the deficit, the, the, they tell you what per person mm -hmm. uh, global average is that we're using, mm -hmm. which was the mm -hmm. earth overshoot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then they'd say, and, and that's a deficit of this much. Yeah. Um, and I, I haven't seen that for the last two, three years now. I haven't Actually, seen that anymore. Mm -hmm. We yeah. will do, I mean, we, we, we're now, this year for the first time, it will be a bit more active in Germany. That it will be what we call German Overshoot Day. As its acronym is God. So, so we, it's a very godly affair. <laughs> it's on the 5th of May. Um, and, and so we're, we're pushing that a bit. So for countries, it's a bit more complex. There are actually two different days. So for the world, it's Earth Overshoot Day. So by when have you used as much as Earth can renew? Uh, for, for a country, there's a number of ways you could look at it. One is to say, if everybody lived like Germans in the world, by when would be Earth Overshoot Day? That's the 5th of May. If everybody lived like the Germans around the world, we'd be at Earth Overshoot Day or on May 5th. You can also look at it from the perspective of if, by when have Germany used up the German budget? Now, Germany is kind of, 
peculiar because it's the country, its biocapacity per person is about the same as the world's biocapacity per person. So, so the pro productivity per person in Germany is about the same as worldwide. It's more densely populated, but it's also wetter, so it has more kind of f fertility concentrated. So in terms of, it's not in terms of space is it average, but in terms of global hectares, because it's more concentrated. Uh, in Switzerland, for example, we use four and a half Switzerlands, you know, so. Yeah, and, and uh, in some some respects, the limits to growth already kind of also talked about that overshoot and how, you know, absolutely the different yeah. scenario. I mean, so, they use the term overshoot, absolutely, yeah. just that they speculate about the future, how it will play out. Yeah. And, yeah. and I think what people don't understand so well, I mean, if one is kind of the overshoot theme that we can use more. And so it's kind of the, the idea of limits. People think it's like a wall and that's it, you know, but actually it's more like, with, with finances, you can spend more than that you earn. It's not a hard wall. So it's kind of the difference between flows and stocks that so you don't start to deplete, to deplete stocks. Um, so that's kind of one thing. And then the other thing that is even less understood is you can increase your demand at a time where you're in overshoot, which we have done. I mean, since the seventies, we started to use more than what earth can renew. And as I said, it's not the ideal to just use the entire planet, but that's when we started to cross the one planet line. And, um, and and we have been able, even as we use more, we have been able to increase it. And we still are able to increase it. And and so just the, the, the debt that we leave and the implications for lost biocapacity is different. So the future will be regenerative, as I said earlier. There's no other way. The only question is how quickly we get there. If we, if we do the transformation fast, more of the regenerative capacity will still be available as our future budget. If we go slow, we also burn the Earth's ability to regenerate to some extent, not totally, but to some extent. So there would be less biocapacity and perhaps more erratic biocapacity available, which would make it more difficult uh, to, to have a steady income uh, and, 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 and also at, that, at, the, at the similar level. So that, that will be the hardship. So the choice is between fast and slow, not about yeah. whether or. It yeah, we're definitely moving towards everything regenerative. You know, most people are still getting used to this. And I've been speaking about the last three years, but it's regenerative economies, regenerative medicine, regenerative agriculture, on yeah. and on. It's the, the entire regenerative. Um, just the, the word, I mean, to, so, so, yeah. to do that is actually Go interesting. Ahead. On some level, I love that the word is kind of now more used regenerative rather than sustainability because regenerative sounds more like life you know we regenerate and kind of the biological side comes more of four but like with any word there's a slight danger that when we have an adjective it may destroy systems thinking because we think something is attached to the object you know does it is this sustainable or not is it regenerative or not it's all about context yeah. for example a horse hmm. is renewable and regenerative you could you could think a horse but if you had 70 trillion horses on the planet that wouldn't work out either you know so so it's so it's a it's, it's a it's a systems concept does it fit within the context so yeah if it's kind of totally destructive then per se it doesn't fit but even if it's renewable in itself it doesn't necessarily mean it adds up to the whole and so that distinction so so so, so we, we make it too much oh i own this object it is sustainable no, it's about the context. You know, so and 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 really, if you ask, I mean, systems thinking is not that compli complicated. I think the the, the the piece number one of system thinking is understanding context. That's where system thinking starts. What's the context? And that's where kind of the textbook economics taught in economics, the currently called economics classes, fail because they fail recognizing their context. It's very That's, siloed, linear approaches. It's not a lot of systems. And then the other yeah. is all, also that context. I mean, Herman Daly mentions it, it yeah. as well. But I mean, thank, thank God for uh, Donella Meadows and her, her great books, uh, mm -hmm. Thinking oh, in amazing, Systems yeah. and Systems Thinking and, and, and that kind of push forward. There's many that have come since. I really saw a shift in 2018. All international organizations made a conscious shift to systems thinking, the systems view approach to life. I'm a graduate of the Capra courses from Fritzhof Capra and the oh, systems awesome. view of life. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and I, I love it. But uh, the UN started these uh, systems models of the sustainable development goals and other things, basing it on the old limits to growth and, and uh, this Donella Meadows thinking. But then the WEP had transformational maps on, on their website from the fourth industrial revolution book from Klaus Schwab. They, and, and they made a conscious shift to say, okay, we're the only way we're going to solve our global grand challenges is really to look at it that way. But you summed it up so nicely. It's not just about putting the words, say, okay, this system thinking. We got to put, make sure that it's not, <laughs> we're just not saying, okay, it's systems thinking, slapping that on. We need to make sure it's in the context of, of the entire. I, um, I, yeah, I have one funny hobby. Yeah. It's my little hobby. It's called the World Economic Forum. And they, I mean, they, it's, it's, they have great materials and they like to bring people together and to like whatever. Uh, and they have the risks report that shows all these extreme risks. And it's it's not written by some crazy ecologists, but actually they ask the CEOs of their members, whatever companies, what, what they think and some academics, whatever. And then at the same time, they have the competitors report, the real important one, the real important one. Also built based on an index as another little pet peeve. Indices have no scientific validity because they're just made up scoring systems, but they're published by all the great Ivy League universities and it's, it's, it's total absurdity. But anyhow, so they have this competitiveness index to say, which countries are able to produce in the long run, like are really competitive. And then um, it's built out of a hundred plus indicators. And guess what? Not one of them, not one of them has anything about energy, environment, climate change, you name it, water, and nothing, nothing, zero. Just, yeah. do you have airports? Is it open to open a business? Is it easy to open business? Can you hire and fire people? You know, so, and I said, wow. So I, I wrote to them, <laughs> dear Professor Schwab, <laughs> how can you do that? <laughs> I call it a vexing contradiction. And so so Professor Schwab is credit. He put me in contact with his people. It took them a long time that they had time for me to talk to them because they were so busy, so important. And so they said, so very complicated. It's so complicated. Said, it's not that complicated. <laughs> I didn't help you. No, it's very complicated. I said, okay, it's complicated. And so I didn't pay attention. And then in the next edition, they actually put in the ecological footprint as a context indicator. Not in right. the in the numbers. This is a context indicator, and then they said, "Oh, what we see, there's a there's a tension between environmental sustainability and economic competitiveness." I said, oh, really? So I said, "Dear Professor Schwab, thank you that put the footprint as a context indicator." The report says there's a contradiction, but isn't competitiveness about the future ability to produce and isn't sustainability about the future ability to produce okay maybe it's like the different time scales i don't know but how can they be in contradiction the, oh yeah yeah talk to them again uh, again they had not hadn't have time to talk about it and then the next one had like <laughs> and you should read the introduction and it's like the most gobbledygook text that I've, I've seen in terms of oh yeah it's so complicated and and we have to just do the right things and with smart policy everything will be resolved and again nothing so i think it's kind of the interest so it's kind of where are these knowledge pieces held you know so you have to say oh yeah we do system thing we do everything we can talk about sustainability and we have esg for financial investment a third of the investment of the world is under esg scrutiny whatever that means you actually start to correlate the sg criteria of this finance there's no this you just see a cloud you know and that's, i think that's kind of part of the tragedy you have the sdgs there and i'm glad they exist on some level we did it we did a little paper to, to show to what extent are sdgs environmentally sustainable and actually the way they are set up and that's because of political pressures they are strongly strongly negatively correlated with environmental sustainability because they're not set up in a way to actually take ecological economics seriously it's, it's and, and, and i've read and, that and, and, and paper so, and mm -hmm. i've read that paper and your other papers on on the sdgs you guys have uh in, in your network have set up a plethora of wonderful papers the paper you mentioned a couple of times is coming out and and is mm -hmm. it in nature nature is coming out yes coming out soon i recommend anybody read read that 
um, the, you need to be aligned w- with what you're thinking. We still have not gotten to where I want to get. The, oh my goodness. I want to, I want to help the transformation a little bit for, for my <laughs> listeners. And, and that is, um, you know, Herman okay, Daly talked about yeah. planetary boundaries and, and costs becoming greater than benefit mm-hmm. and that prices need to include the external costs and, and quantitative limits that uh, he even talked about ecological tax reform. And, and as you mentioned it so nicely, you know, planetary boundaries, uh, Johan Rockstrom and, and um, plus the Institute of, of Klima Shift yeah. and Climate mm-hmm. Change. And, and those working on that are, are definitely, uh, I, I hope you can collaborate. I hope that uh, because it would only str- strengthen that because there are, uh, when it first came out, nine planetary boundaries and the way that they're divided mm-hmm. up that so closely also tied to the donut economics and that. Um, having given enough credit- I mean, donut and, economics, and, is, I think donut economics just says there's, planetary constraints and we want to have good lives and so they used as a way to populate it the planetary boundary but it's like i mean there's, there's no we could there's no reason you could use the footprint I mean, it's all it's all similar it depends on what you're trying to do so i think that the underlying thinking is very much there that they all recognize that the, the soccer game we are playing is human well-being and planetary constraints how can we get that to work together because it's that's the tension we need to navigate and so in that way this is all the same i think there may so, be some uh, some different tensions there may be some some slight different tensions as i said in terms of like the, the tragedy of the commons versus getting the game how do we frame it uh, i i believe actually on like for the, the, the focus too much on international negotiations could detract us from recognizing the self-interest so, so, so I think the moral arguments, they sound very soothing because they're, they're beautiful. And so I think that one of the most destructive sentences in climate, the climate debate is to say, oh, these poor islands in the Pacific that will disappear and, 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 the, and the poor people in the South, blah, blah, blah. And it's, of course it's true. But it it separates because it's a, it's the talk within the urban elite of saying, oh, it's the others, it's othering. It is environmental colonialism, rather it than is. recognizing how we sit in it ourselves and how we are like it's, it's relevant to us directly. Absolutely, I and mean, Kate Rollworth says it as well. She says mm-hmm. we have this this thing called weird societies. The Western, educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic, and they're all in the West talking about the island states and and these. It, it, it's this conv- convoluted way of looking the world, and, and it's so small. It's not reality. Um, I, I think we've promoted all the others and and their great books and their their thoughts enough. I I really want to dive in. I love that. The you, weird. I hadn't and, heard that before. To, I've, 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 yeah, that's kind of Kate's. It's great. Wonderful. Yeah. I, I really want to <laughs> really uh, promote and get into to the global footprint and the global hectare a little bit more and kind of bounce some things off, off of you and, and have some discussions. I have been working for a couple of years now. I, I would like to do a global a universal global hectare that is an inalienable right for every single human being. The minute you're born until you die, you are given whatever the the time of your the birth, portion, the global yeah. hectare is 1.6. If it's, you know, if you're lucky a few years ago, you came in and, and you were born, it was 1.7, but it's kind of a daily fluctuation depending on how um, we're living and doing. And then that's uh, something that everyone has uh, this replicable global hectare that they get from birth and it's an inalienable right. And there is a way through that stewardship that if we have good stewardship over it, the way we live, if we live in a passive house, if we work for a great company that uh, we can increase our global footprint, so to say, we can kind of be net positive Mm -hmm. and and, and have a better balance which increases that for the rest of the world. Uh, but if we're bad stewardships and we're living like, you know, 
Donald Trump or some Americans where we're using a hundred Earths or, or whatever because of our footprint, because uh, of the, our lifestyle, that we're actually taking it away uh, from others or we're using more than we have outside of that uh, safe space. And, and there's some, it's very complicated, but it uh, can work in several ways. So on, on a basic level, uh, let's say you live in a multifamily um, apartment where there's maybe five families between two to four individuals that hopefully you have enough space for that family in each unit. Maybe let's say there's a minimum 100 square meters per unit in, in, that, in that building. And uh, as children are born and they have that same global hectare, they probably won't use as much, but that goes to the family unit. And mm. that, that, that family and those individuals who are living in an apartment, 100 square meters, are living on much smaller than 1.6 global hectares. But the building they live in is run on renewable energy. Mm. It's run on uh, rainwater recycling and ambient water harvesting. And they have some kind of battery yeah. spiker or geothermal. Mm. They're a passive house. Yeah. They maybe I have think a the, this vision is very like obviously you talked about one planet living and kind of this kind of yeah. try to establish yeah. and, and, and and experiment with. And I think we that's the big experiment of our time, how to do it. On some level, of course, like that's so so what our function is is more kind of we provide a like the, the camera like the accounting function of just saying we don't have a beef and saying you have to do it like this or like that we're not the central government that kind of allocates and tells us so we are separating the normative and the descriptive and that's why we just actually set up a new organization just to maintain the national footprint account as a separate like entity together with york university to make that just as you need a you need a metric like the the tailor needs to be able to measure the cloth you know i mean the baker needs to have a scale so so that's kind of the 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 basic um the, the, the basic necessity and and then ideas like you're putting forward then become feasible to say we need to have we need to think about the budgeting how do we do collective budgeting we do it around money we do it around many other things uh we're metering electricity you know <laughs> i mean so so how do we deal with with physical reality so do you, yeah, yeah. Do you so. believe there's a way that that depending on how we live or how we do our our, our businesses our companies our our cities our communities that we can increase our global hectare uh, absolutely so, yeah, yeah, I, mean, I, I do as well mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, so so it's both and it's both sides. I mean, it's like with money, income, and expenditures. I mean, what we've seen, I mean, some of the ways of increasing this regeneration and kind of can be very mechanistic and kind of use more fertilizer and kind of more tractors and more energy and whatever, and that may not have lasting effects. It's like it's more like doping and an athlete who can run faster, perhaps a little bit, but then wears out. Um, so. A, a lot is possible on the on the on the consumption side too, and I mean, so the consumption is not just the ultimate consumption, but we, can, I mean, uh, we many people could live in houses that are kind of energy positive, you know, for example. So that's possible. I love to bicycle. Just uh, it's so much more fun to be on the bicycle and see more than being in a car. I would do it even if it took more resources than being in a car. It's just so much fun, you know. But if if life becomes so much better. And by the way, it doesn't use have any resources, that's better. But I think the other thing, that's why we're focusing so much on the sense of resource security. So we're not taking away. And that's why I think we also use the word move the date so much, because it's not about when you say reduce your footprint. Say, oh my God, why are you taking my chocolate? Okay, maybe next year. But so it's kind of, oh, it's kind of this oh, shrinking away. No, it's going to move the date. We are expanding your resource security and our collective one. So we'll have we'll have a better life. And I think that's kind of the, the, the reality. How can we produce this? Perhaps a little bit an abstract idea, but there we need to have a sense of abundance so we can be generous and we can produce the psychological space and the way of living that to feel this abundance of ideas and that we create we, by talking with each other we feel oh there's there's things opening up it's a sense of abundance and possibility in a context of severe physical scarcity and that's kind of the big artistic trick. I mean, it's not a trick. I mean, it's kind of the, 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 the story is possible. How, how can we produce an abundance, sense of abundance for people in this context of physical scarcity? 
and 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 we may not be able to get to that transfer that transformation that fast enough and that will leave some damages so the earlier we do it the better um there are huge possibilities available and there's like and and it's and and currently already we are physically threefold too large and it, it will have to mean to look at all kinds of various dimensions that we use the hand move the date i don't know if you see it move the date yeah, find the fingers it's like how much do we regenerate like a more regenerative agriculture more conservation just there's so, so many practices that can make the, the planet healthy and stronger the biocapacity stronger and then on demand state i mean it's overlapping to some extent but the ultimate outcomes of financing and policy, et cetera, is how we organize our lives, particularly through cities, our cities constructed. How do we power our cities? Like, do we have coal power plants or solar power? Everything has an impact, but different degrees. How do we feed ourselves? Already half of the planet right now is occupied for food. And then how many we are. And this is, it's a very delicate issue to talk about the population size, but it's a very significant dynamic and the good news is by addressing it there's so many other problems we can address as well i mean who doesn't want that everybody has equal rights men and women have equal rights having everybody participate fully leads to healthier families smaller families better educated families uh, what's against it and then and it's I mean, it's stunning i don't know how much you're built into the gym kind of uh, language group, but I, I, I see a lot of conversations in Germany about population saying, oh my God, they have two small families, the Germans are dying out. It's rubbish. I mean, kind of actually in an industrial society, slowly shrinking populations are an economic advantage. If you think you need to have a growing population to pay for pensions, then you buy into a pension scheme. And the reality is because in industrial societies, it takes so long for young people to get ready for the workforce. That's a part of the dependency as well, not just old people. Old people now, they live healthier. They can help themselves more. Probably may have to live to work longer. So you cannot have like when, 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 when unemployment and unemployment when pension was uh, in, um, started in Switzerland. In, in, in and, and 65 was put as the age of, of retirement guess what 65 was actually the life expectancy in switzerland yeah. you know, and now the life expectancy of 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 men in switzerland is i think 80 or or, or, or in higher so so <laughs> there have to be some adjustments obviously but in terms of dependency ratio just physically speaking how many people are able to work compared to how many need to be looked after the ratio of a slowly shrinking population in the industrial age is becoming far more favorable so it's not even an economic problem so so the, so the fear about shrinkage is just stunning and, and and totally misinformed and and i haven't seen yet an article in the german news that actually makes the opposite argument it's always about lamenting about cultural suicide i don't know what i mean this is stunning and it's not just Germany, but I, I, just, I see it in Germany. And just to as we as you live in Germany, <laughs> I mentioned that. <laughs> I, I'm from I'm from America, but I live in Germany. My family is German and Austria on my mother's mm -hmm. side, and mm -hmm. and uh, have a lot from Spain, Italy, and, and mm -hmm. um, uh, relatives and that. But yeah, it's it's a unique world we live in. I have. Five more questions for you, and oh, then then we're goodness. done. And I'm sorry okay, we good. we've taken this over, but through, yeah. we could oh. we could talk for hours. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, the, the, <laughs> the, the the biggest one that I really think we need to I need to get the answer from you is the burning question, WTF? And yes, we've been asking that these last twelve months, but it's not the swear word. It's what's the futures? And I'd like to get your vision and maybe your network's uh, vision. What's the future? Where do we need to go? Where do we need to be? I mean, it's pretty obvious and everybody can has, has, has a good idea where we want to go because we see more like where we don't want to go. Maybe not enough where we want to go. It's totally possible to live well within the means of one planet. We can make this transformation. It's economically beneficial. It's like financially beneficial. It's obviously medically beneficial. I mean, there's only benefits. Why are we not doing it? That's very, uh, that's the question. I still don't understand and that keeps me fascinated every day like i've done it for 30 years how can you do that forever isn't it depressing i don't think so i feel like a soccer player no i just i'm in love with playing soccer i'm not winning the, the, the world championship <laughs> but it's still great to play and that's the question say why are we not 
understanding our own self-interest. It's, it's, it's so fascinating. But it also has the energy because the, the self-interest is there. The energy is there to make it possible. It's not like, it, 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 that's why it's a tragedy, not because it's inevitable, but because it's, because it is inevitable. Like it, it is inevitable or it is, <laughs> we don't have, it's not inevitable and we are not seizing the opportunity. And it's, it's so fascinating. So we could have great lives, and and I started as a as an engineer, I believe, and technology could do a lot, and but I mean, so so, so many opportunities. It's, would yeah, would it's you consider yourself to be a human ecologist, or what? Well, how would you define you and your work? What? How? I mean, what, what's the term that you give? People? I'm just curious. Just curious. Yeah, just curious. yeah. I mean, yeah. because you you really have. And that's what many people probably say to he's a little curious. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, it, it, it's really. You, uh, we could talk for hours, and we won't. We'll have to. We'll have to schedule another call eventually. Um, but if there was one message that you could depart to my listeners as a sustainable takeaway that has the power to change their life, what would it be? Your message? Give up one thing. Never say should again. What should young innovators in your field or thinking about activism environment be looking for ways to make a real impact on, on our earth? I, I struggle with that question myself. Um, I think just being okay with not knowing and staying curious with the inquiry um i think can bring you the energy you need like recognizing the privilege we have to be able to engage with these questions and the beauty it brings to our lives and and that not knowing is uncomfortable and and and, and the deep listening we can bring to others and together we can do incredible things i i this is the last question i come from um six generations of germany's uh, uh farmers and organic wow. farmers and um, that not only did uh, William Reese and you, and mm -hmm. there's some examples around farming and things also that have to do with the global hectare, um, but what have you experienced or learned in your professional journey so far, <laughs> this whole thing till now that you said, boy, I, I would have loved to know that from, from the start. I think, I mean, that's, that's kind of the obsession that I'm on right now, kind of the significance of skin in the game. I have worked with too many that when I actually start to realize later on why they don't really have skin in the game, like institutions that are just there to maintain things and they want to talk about it, but actually they're not really vested in having the problem being solved. That's kind of uh, an insight that came too late in my life, or not too late, the late, <laughs> no, I mean, too late in the sense that, as you asked, if I had that insight earlier on to really understand who has skin and in the if game. if you would have had that insight earlier on, would you have, you would have caught, you know, I mean, called bullshit or kind of, kind of came forward and say, hey, you know, uh, do you really have skin or are you just pulling my chain because you, you just do not giving me lip service or, or what, what would you have done with that information? I mean, choosing your partners, then how you work with them, how you frame the benefits much, much more clearly. Yeah. I think also something that, I mean, that it wasn't clear on, on some level. I think some people don't like our message that much. And so also because our message has been around for a long time, it's been boring. So it can sometimes feel like, maybe a negative word it's like oh yeah I feel ostracized you know it's kind of like, kind of you think you have like a an answer and nobody is interested and and so you can easily fall in the trap that you think oh people don't understand we have to explain things better or whatever it is rather than seeing that as a power now, being ostracized means you're actually annoying <laughs> so how do you use that power rather than it's not, so it's not you can see that from a victim side oh i'm being ostracized wow they get annoyed. <laughs> so who are our friends who want them to get annoyed as well? 
maybe they are your friends. But I think understanding kind of who are your, I mean, it's not just, it's not just friend and foe, it's not just at that level, it's kind of just aligned in, in, from an incentive perspective of, of making something happen and then something more can happen. And I wish I knew that better too, um, because obviously my dreams are much bigger than what we have been able to achieve. And perhaps if they weren't, that would be boring. <laughs> I, 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 that is all I have for you, Matis. I, I want to encourage all my listeners, please get the book. Please go to the website, footprintnetwork.org. I'm going to list in the show notes all mm -hmm. the places people can reach out, find out about um, the global hectare about the ecological footprint and kind of help move the date uh, yeah. and and really think of that. Uh, look at your new papers that are coming out in nature and things. But I really thank you for your time. I honestly Pleasure. truly mean it. I, I could speak to you for hours because I, I want to pick your brain. I think we're along. I think about these things all the time. I, That's I, awesome. I really, thank you so much, Mark. Mm -hmm. I appreciate yeah. your time. And that's yeah. all I have. Thank yeah. you very much. Unless that's great. there's something else you yeah. didn't get and, and, and for those who love geography and traveling, particularly as we're stuck at home, I would like the, the first site I would go to is data.footprintnetwork.org because it may, gives you a map of the world. You can go to every country and see kind of what's the resource situation? How have they changed? And I think it's quite fascinating. Thank you very much. You have a wonderful weekend coming up. I appreciate it. Thanks. You Marcus. too. Be well, be safe, and uh, talk to you soon. Thanks. Talk to you later. Bye.